Sometimes it's considered the or it's called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And you read it and you're like, oh, okay, that that that's clear. And then sometimes if you're like me, you're thinking, well, and one of the things that the book that James just cannot stand is hypocrisy. And he's talking, he's teaching against hypocrisy. And as I read James in it, in its clarity, in its uh, succinctness, and its admittedly uh, uh, put, uh, applicability. I see myself, whoa, I can say one thing, but I ain't doing what this book says. Ooh, you hip it twist. <laughs> the beauty of it all, though, is it's not the book of James isn't to, to condemn us. The book of James is to exhort us to do and to be about what, we, what Christ is all about. And to live our lives according to the faith that we already have in him, enabled and empowered, free from the condemnation of the law, and empowered by the Holy Spirit of what we can do, namely, live genuine, have genuine faith, lived out genuine. Does that make sense? So that's where we're going. Uh, turn to the book of James, and may the Holy Spirit transform us through the study of his word today, so that we would not be hypocrites, but would be a people who live out the reality of the Christian faith each day in practical ways. So, uh, background, you have a handout, I hope it's helpful a little bit, but in the background, uh, the author of the book is James. So which James, which James is it? I believe, I believe pretty strongly, and church history believes it, and there's good strong evidence that the book of James was written by James, Jesus' brother, or technically his half-brother, okay? So we know that uh, Joseph and Mary, uh, obviously there's a, a miraculous conception of Jesus and his birth, Right? Subsequent, after that, they had other children, particularly brothers we know, uh, naturally in the full sense of the term, and, and so he, Jesus had siblings. One of them was named James. Now what's interesting about James and the family is, is during the life of Jesus, particularly in the beginning of his ministry, you can read in, in uh, John chapter 7, his family, Mary and the brothers, thought Jesus, as he began his, his ministry, thought he was cuckoo. They thought he was going nuts. They did not see him as the Messiah, the, the, the promised one. It's like, and part of me is like, really? How could they not? And the other part's like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> but 
But further on in Acts chapter 1, you'll read in Acts chapter 1 in, in the upper room, who's there? Well, Mary and Jesus' brothers are in the upper room in the beginning of Acts. Galatians chapter 5, Paul calls James, Jesus' brother, half-brother, a pillar in the church of Jerusalem. Wait, hold on. We just went from Jesus is, you know, we thinking he's cuckoo, to now he's a pillar in the church that is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. <coughs> Acts 15, turn, with, turn real quick. We're, we'll pretend we have time for this. Acts 15, <laughs> verse 15. Acts 15, verse 15. Well, I'm going to get there eventually. Read with me. This is, what's going on here is the church is trying, is wrestling with how Jewish does someone have to be in order to be saved? Do you have to be circumcised? Do you have to follow the Jewish law? Do you have to become a Jew first and then trust Christ? And So there's this, this theological and practical question that's approached the church. And they have a council, the church has a council in Jerusalem. But look at verse 12 through 15. They discussed the matter. Now the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Short answer, short to fit. Gentiles, non-Jewish people were getting saved. They were evidence of their salvation. They were um, absolutely saved, members of the body of Christ, without ever obeying any of the Jewish law or customs and so forth. And so, so Paul and Barnabas explained this. Verse 13, when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. And the word of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written and so on. So two things. One, James Brother Jesus is truly a pillar in the, the church. He's, he's a spokesperson. He's, he's respected. He, he would be known simply by his name, James. It doesn't have to say James, the half-brother of Jesus. It's, it's, it's known. Furthermore, by the way, this passage is, is another evidence of the James, James being the author of the book of James. Because the language he uses is very similar to what the, how he writes his letter in James. So, that's, so James is a... The now, why is that important? First off, James would be one of the hardest converts, I think. No brother ever wants to look at his brother and say, oh yeah, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. <laughs> I'm going to follow him. So something had to happen. Where, um, By the way, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that one of the post- resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ was to his brother James. And I believe it's at that moment where James was like, oh, you really are who you say you are. You're not crazy. And if you who are who you say you are, even though you're my brother, I know you're my king, my lord, my savior. The conversion of James to me is a powerful indicator of the realities and truth, truth claims of Jesus. Okay? Uh, to date, uh, for various reasons, it is considered this book is written around 47 AD. Now first, you got to think for a minute. What year was Christ crucified? Around what year? 33, 32, 33? And this book is written 47-ish? Not that long after. In fact, the book of James is arguably the first book written in the New Testament. Think about that for a minute. Galatians is probably really early too, but it looks like James is the first book. Yeah. So before anything else is written in the New Testament, this is what is recorded. Providential, this is what's recorded. Wow. Several reasons. One, there's no reference. There's no reference to to any Gentiles in the book. So it's probably that this book was written before, maybe maybe even before Paul began his missionary journeys. That it, that uh, started the whole debate that was answered in the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15. So it was written before Acts 15, probably before Acts 12, maybe even earlier. Does that make sense? 
So the first book, that's, when I read that, it's like, wait, this is, this is the first thing. That's really interesting. Uh, furthermore, it is um, unique in that there's no large sections of doctrine or theology. You know how like, when you read like a Pauline letter, it'll have like, you know, or Hebrews. We, last week we talked about Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1 and this glorious exalting of, of Christ and who he is and in heavens and this massive section of, of doctrine and theology, right? James doesn't have that. Does that mean there's no theology? Does that mean there's no doctrine? Absolutely not. First, uh, the, the, the theology of Christ, the gospel message, and all that that entails is embedded in James. When he talks of faith, when he talks of, of, of history, it's all embedded in there. Okay, It's assumed, I should say. Where, for example, he says he's writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, the, embedded in that is the gospel, the theology of of God and man and sin and salvation and so forth. Okay. But also, it's, it's, it's assumed that also it's embedded. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18 real quickly. Because there's, there's nuggets all the way through this book. Uh, verse 16, it says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good gift, every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. Above. See, that's theology, by the way. That, that's doctrine. That, that's, you know, right there. But even more so, from above, coming down from Father of heavenly lights. Now listen to this. Who, we're going to learn something about God, theology, who does not what? Change. Change. Like shifting shadow. Right? Our Father of heavenly lights it doesn't change like the shifting shadow. God is the same yesterday as he is today as he will be forever and ever. So there's theology and doctrine in here. It's just not packaged the same way as, as some of the other ones. Okay? So, uh, the circumstances. What's going on? Read with me verse 1 and 1. James, a servant of God and the Lord, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that statement. How does James see Jesus as his Lord? And who is he writing to? The twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Now, there was, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, when Assyria came through and, and finally took out the, the ten tribes and the, um, and the rest of Israel ceased and they were scattered among the nations of the diaspora, right? Okay. Some of them came back to Jerusalem throughout the years. And in particular, now when you have Acts chapter 7 and 8, when it comes to the church, what happens in Acts chapter 7? Anybody remember? Acts chapter 7, people, Jewish people are getting saved, right? Pentecost and all this stuff. And a guy named Stephen's proclaiming Jesus. And what happens to Stephen? He gets stoned. The first martyr, right? First recorded martyr. So he's martyred. And then chapter 8 starts with the church is scattered amongst the wrong scattered. Because of the persecution, they are scattered. And so what James is saying here, I'm writing this to my, my Jewish brothers and sisters who are scattered, my Jewish Christian brothers and sisters who are scattered among the land. So the situation is, the people he's writing to are scattered all around, and they're being persecuted. They're under persecution. They're under trials and difficulties and challenges. So, as, as, and by the way, there's lots of books in the New Testament are talking to people who are going through persecutions and trials and difficulties. The beauty of this is, even though our persecutions and even though our trials and challenges may be different today, it tells this automatically. I'm like, oh, on some level, I'm, I, I, I need to listen to this. What is James going to tell them? Because what's happening is, and you'll read this, and it comes out as you read this this week, they, the, the persecutions are revealing uh, some bad stuff. In fact, they're reacting they're, they're to the persecutions in bad ways. And they're probably writing letters back to Jerusalem, back to James saying, hey, this is going on in the church. This is going on around here. What do we do? What about this? And James is writing a letter back to all of them saying, hey, 
<coughs> this is what I'm hearing going on. Don't do this, do this, and so forth. Does that make sense? And so this is considered a general epistle, general letter, because it's not written to a specific person or a specific church. It's written to, to a group of churches in, around the land. And so the idea was that it was going to be circulated around to be beneficial and helpful. Right? How are we doing so far? All right? Circumstances. So the key, I think one of the keys to understanding this is the people are under persecution, trials, tests, challenges, however you want to name it, and it was resulting in bad behavior, and James is offering some corrective help. Okay? You have an outline. Um, I stole from uh, Walbert and Zook, fantastic um, commentators and, and scholars, and I think it just gives a kind of pattern or something to help as you read through it, hopefully. All right? So, now, the challenge with uh, James is that it is an incredibly challenging book for two reasons. One is kind of challenging, and the other one is, well, at least for me, not you guys, very challenging. The kind of challenging is there's, part, there's some passages, some things in this book that are a little hard to understand. And at first blush, it's like, what? That doesn't sound right. And that's kind of, and it kind of challenges our thinking. Like, wait, 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 wait. We got to figure that out because that just doesn't sound like what I think the, I've heard elsewhere in the Bible. The classic example of this is chapter verse, chapter two, verse fourteen and following. So turn to chapter two, verse fourteen and following. By the way, this is the this passage is the first is the passage of my first sermon I ever preached. It, I did not choose this passage. It was assigned to me, just to be clear. I would not choose this as my friend. When, when my professor gave it to me, I was like, really? Don't, and he kind of smiled with a wry smile. He looked at me, hey, you get James chapter 2, verse 14 a mile. I'm like, you don't like me? What's wrong? He says, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> so, but it is. It is a challenging passage. So let's just read this uh, section for a minute. Okay. So what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Save them, excuse me. Now suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Now in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is what? Dead. Dead. But someone says, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Now, hold on. Did, did you see If in the same way, faith by action, if it's not accompanied by faith, action is dead. Does anyone else read that and like, that just doesn't sound quite right. I feel like the Bible teaches something different somewhere else. Uh, you guys remember Paul? And so, by the way, let me jump to the quick. It does because what does Paul teach? What do we know Paul teach? Um, turn to, uh, let's see. Paul would say, you are saved by grace, what? Not by deeds. Not by works. You are saved by grace, by faith, excuse me. You are saved by faith alone. <laughs> it's a gracious act, right? You're saved by faith alone. Okay? Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 20. Turn back to Romans. Forgive me if we're bouncing around a little bit. I pray it'll be helpful. Romans 3, 20, and follow. Oh, that's 1 Corinthians. That won't work. <laughs> read the screen. Rome, yeah, I could read the screen. Um, yeah, it's way over there. Um, Verse is 20. <laughs> Verse 20 of chapter 3 of Romans, Paul writes, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous, justified, saved, however, in God's sight by what? The works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Verse 21. But now, beautiful contrast, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. Now, this righteousness is given through, here's the key word, faith faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. believe. Therefore, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> so Paul is saying, you are saved, you are declared righteous before God, you are justified by faith. And faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you guys remember this one? 
For by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man boast. So Paul is clearly, the scripture clearly teaches, by the way, it teaches from the first pages of the scripture all the way to the end, just to be clear, that you are saved by faith alone. So but then I come to, to James where it seems says that James says faith without works. So excuse me. Paul would say faith plus works will not save you. Does that make sense? Faith alone. Faith plus works will not save you. James says faith without works will not save you. All right. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 14, we just read. Now here's the key. Both Paul and James, both of them teach that genuine faith, faith that saves, faith that has saved us from the wrath of God based on the belief in Jesus Christ, Faith that saves results in good deeds, results in works, is evidenced by good deeds. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, turn there quickly if you can. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. He writes, So I say, walk by the Spirit, He's speaking to those who are saved, brothers and sisters, he says in verse 13. Walk by the Spirit, and you will what? Not gratify the desires of the flesh. So you're saved, so I say walk by the Spirit, justified under Him, and you will not, your life will be changed. Does that make sense? Ephesians 2.8.9, back to Ephesians. This, this is a good one. Remember that passage? For by grace you are saved, not works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10, the very next verse. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good, good work. <coughs> which God prepared in advance for us to do. He saves us, justifies us by our faith in Him, and enables, creates us to do those good works. You see what I'm saying? So they both are teaching in James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. I'll We'll explain this in chapter 2, verse 1, and gives illustration to it. That both are teaching that genuine faith, faith that saves, results in good works. <coughs> Furthermore, it's, it, the book is written to brothers and sisters in Christ. It's written to believers. So right there, it's like, wait, he's talking to believers already, so he must be talking about something else. He must be referring to something else. So we know this. Good deeds and good works are evidences of an inward reality of inward salvation and justification. Okay? Now, uh, real quick. How do you and I recognize that we are alive? How, you guys are looking at me. What, what evidence am I giving you that I am actually a living person, living being? Help me out here. <coughs> and I know it may be scary, but just help me out here. <laughs> I'm speaking. I'm breathing. I'm walking. I'm talking. I'm, you know, right? It's this vertical, all that stuff. Like my, my skin tone is oof, something, but it's not, you know, white. Right? So, uh, there's evidence. Now, if let's say some of the evidence starts to disappear. Let's say I'm not moving or talking. I'm not vertical. I'm horizontal. I trust, I know you guys well enough, you're kind and gentle. You would come and check me. What would be something you would check? Are you breathing, Daryl? <laughs> they would check, you would, you know, check my, do you have a pulse, right? If I didn't have a pulse, what would you do? <laughs> oh, somebody else. <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> right? You, you would you would take action. You would you would say, hey, this isn't right. Things are not going right. Something's going on. Right? And, and, and so forth. There's all if somebody is alive, there's always some, may not be a lot of evidence, but there's some evidence. Maybe it's just a an, a voluntary movement, not a big gesture. Maybe it's just and so forth, a brainwave, something. There's some evidence of life, and if there's no evidence of life, then you can deduce, or at least question, 
I'm not sure. You do this. So that's what, that's what James is saying. If you don't have any evidence, the point isn't that we go around judging each other, oh, that person doesn't have enough evidence, I don't know about their salvation, and we condemn them. No, that's not the point of James. He's not talking about that kind of judgment. But he's saying, listen, as you evaluate your life, if you don't have any evidence in a changed life or, to, or any evidence of, of Christ working in your heart and in your life and your conscience and your actions that hasn't changed your life, you may want to say, hey, I think I need to get right with Jesus. You see what I'm saying? And when we do that, and furthermore, he's not talking about uh, the evidence is perfection. Clearly not. <laughs> it's just what is the pattern? What is the ongoing? It's like, is there any evidence? And James would say there should be an abundance of evidence because of all that Christ has done. It should affect every area of your life. Every area. Okay? Uh, going back to the police, summarize it this way, not by my words, but people much smarter than me of the Reformation age. Faith alone justifies, faith alone justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. Faith alone justifies, faith that justifies is never alone. All right? Okay. So, that's a challenging <coughs> passage. Now, another one, real quick. Uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, Paul is uh, Paul's talking about not showing favoritism. Man, he gets practical. Um, he says, uh, Now, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Now, you may read that like, what is the royal law? I thought we were preaching the law and all that stuff. What is the royal law? I take this passage to mean, he's speaking of the law, or the rule, or the commands of the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. that is particularly inaugurated by Christ in first incarnation. And what you see here, and there's lots of other passages that we're going to explore on Wednesday night, by the way, is, remember when Jesus is, is um, giving the Sermon on the Mount? Mm -hmm. Right? And he's giving all the, the, the um, instructions and, you know, <coughs> Things against speaking and, and uh, cursing your brother and how you treat him and, and uh, looking at a woman lustfully as you're guilty and so forth. He, he's taking the law and he's showing, like, wait, 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 you think it means this. Let me give you the, let me give you the full version and the full extent of God's expectation. What, the king, what my kingdom is all about, this is what it is, this whole Sermon on the Mount. Okay? James, and this is beautiful. Patterns, echoes, mirrors, extract, moves from the Sermon on the Mount in so many ways. It's beautiful. We'll explore that on Wednesday. But here it is. So this royal law is the law, the 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 <coughs> law of the rule of the kingdom of God, of Christ's kingdom. And it gives a particular evidence to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says that, right, too? Right? It's in the Old Testament as well. And so forth. Okay, uh, look at verse 125, 125. Uh, verse 22 gives some context. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't just read it, don't just study it, but actually do it. Now anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after that looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. That's me. Uh, anyways... But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So what is this perfect law that gives freedom? Sometimes it's called or translated the law of liberty. What I take this to mean, and just I say this to help because sometimes this is a little unclear. I take this to mean the Old Testament letter, and let me give credit where it's due, uh, Professor Stanley Toussaint from Dallas Theological Health. Been a immense help to me on this one. The Old Testament law that has been brought to fruition in Christ and into the New, new Covenant. Okay? So the law of liberty, liberty, law of liberty, is the Old Testament law that has been brought to fruition, 
accomplished, fulfilled, and so forth in Christ. So, in Christ, the liberty part is, one, in Christ, we are saved, rescued, from the condemnation of the law, right? Correct? So we are free, freedom, from the power of sin and the power of the law, right? So we are free from that. Moreover, this is where it gets really good, and this is really helpful when you read the book of James. Moreover, the other half of that coin is, not only have we been free and the power of sin is broken in our lives, we are free to obey it because we have Christ's Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, enabling us to do it. Okay? So this law of liberty, anyone who, anyone who, who reads the word and actually does it, we are moving in the freedom of, this isn't a, a law to condemn us, it's actually we're moving in the freedom because not only we have the power of sin has been broken, and we are able to, we are enabled by the Holy Spirit to actually obey and do what God wants. This is helpful when you read James. Because I read James, and it's like, oh, I mm, didn't do that, didn't do that, didn't... And part of me says, oh, I just got to work harder and pull, pull myself up by the bootstraps and, and uh, knuckle down and get it. And while there is intentionality and we do need to work at it, we are working under the power of the Holy Spirit so we can actually control our tongue, as James would spend a whole lot of words explaining. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't want to start meddling right away. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. Now let's get to the let's get to the really challenging part because those are challenging. A little bit of thought, a little bit of study. You can you can okay. I, I got that squared away. Those are hard, but okay. What's really challenging is all the stuff I do understand. <laughs> For example, turn back to chapter one, James chapter one. We're reading verse two through seven, if you will. He writes. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Okay, right off the bat, we ought to be able to that ain't easy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed in the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, you don't have to be a rocket science, a Bible scholar, a Greek guru, to read that and be going, ooh, consider it pure joy whenever you face... All kinds of troubles and trials, testing, challenges, persecutions, and all of their colors and variations and flavors, and consider pure joy. Really? This last week, you probably faced some difficulties. Amen. Did you go, yippee? <laughs> no. Let's be clear. That's not what this is saying. It's not saying we rejoice for the trial, or the difficulty, or the temptation, or the testing, or the whatever. But what are we rejoicing in? He says we're rejoicing in what it can bring. We rejoice in what that test <coughs> brings to us, or it helps us with what the fruit of that testing, if we, if we, big caveat, assume presumed in this text, if we successfully endure as God would want. Okay? So, uh, we've all taken tests in school. The good teachers, they'll write a test, and they don't write a test to, to make, to, to like, oh, watch this, I'm, I'm going to get it so they all fail. Uh-uh, no way. A good teacher writes a test, and what does that test do? That test will reveal some blind spots. You thought you knew all the subject matter? Well, not so much. What about this one? See, it's no different here. 
God allows stuff to come into our lives in many different ways, and as we navigate that difficulty, that trial, it's going to reveal something. Well, ooh, that's in my heart. I'm driving down 27, something happens, and ooh, we're, mm, oh, okay. Well, I got that diagnosis, and like, ah, now I'm really afraid. I thought I had all the faith in the world, and nah, nah, nah. you see what I'm saying? But as we navigate, as we endure, as we persevere, right? As we persevere successfully trusting and following and acting and reacting as God would intend, what does that bring? Maturity. We would all want to be mature in Christ, spiritually mature, having a faith that is growing and alive, and right? No matter what comes down the pike. But you can't get there without difficulty. <laughs> uh, one illustration I heard was, uh, <laughs> this is a stark statement, show me a Christian who's never gone through trials and tribulations and difficulties, and I will show you a wimpy Christian. Let's put it more physically. Show me a person who's never lifted a heavy object in their life, let alone lifted it repeatedly, and I will show you someone who's physically weak. Right? Yeah. The spiritual end is the same thing. But we don't need to go searching and looking in, in four hard times. No, no, they're going to come fast and furious. <laughs> but as they do, James says, listen, guys, I know you're being persecuted. I know you're running scared. I know life's falling apart. I know X, Y, and Z. Endure, persevere, because get, guess what? Something awesome is, can come out of that as you place your faith in Christ and navigate successfully. He gives them a whole new perspective. He gives you and I a whole new perspective that is ever so helpful come Monday morning. Now, look at look verse 4 real quick, though. Now he starts touching, and he starts, he says, Now let perseverance finish his works and be mature. Now, if you lack wisdom, if you don't know what to do in the midst of trials and difficulties and challenges and persecutions, also, if you don't know, have you ever been there, by the way? I don't know what to do. What, what is it? You should ask God who gives generously to all who, without finding fault. The, the text here, my understanding is, it, it literally says, Giver God who gives. God by his nature who wants to give wisdom will give you wisdom if you ask him. You don't know what to do in the difficulty of trying, how do I react? How do I, you know what? He says, ask him and he will give freely. And then he starts talking about doubt. And this is really interesting. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave, a wave of sea blown back and forth, tossed back and forth. Now, is he saying you need when you pray, when you ask for God, that when you pray that you 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 say, you know what, uh, God will answer my prayer positively? Is that what he's talking about here? About having you know not doubting? No, 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 no. The idea here is not that you presume or demand or command that God answer your prayer positively. That's not that's not faith without doubt. Faith without doubt says, God, I know you can answer my prayer positively if it's your will. will. It's resting in, in having assurance that God can answer positively and, and, and has power and dominion and rulership over all right. We get that according to his will. Daniel chapter 3, famously, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're standing before Nebuchadnezzar, and they say, you know, we do not have to defend ourselves. God can save us. God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we will still not bow down. Do you see the difference? And if we, and all too often, we, we will start off with, you know, God can. He can come through. He can answer this prayer. He can give the wisdom. They said, and we, we start walking up, but then we're like, oh, it's not going, it's not the way I want, it's, it's getting too hard, and we run back, i got to figure it out, how do I do this? Okay, now if I do this, and I do this, you see, when we run back to our own ways, we, then we go back to God, and we're like, okay, 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 and then we run back to, okay, this is how the world says we should do something, we're a reactor. You see, that's doubt. And James is saying, no, 
set your life, anchor your heart, your mind, your thoughts, your whole totality on the reality that God can come through. And he will come through according to his good and perfect will. And he will give wisdom for those who seek. Does that make sense? But that's challenging. That is challenging. Because in the midst of it, it gets hard. Now look at verse 19, 19 and following. We'll stop at 22 for the sake of time. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. All right, now we're getting hard. Now he's meddling. <coughs> you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. That's obvious. And then he gets more personal. Therefore, get rid of some. Get rid of the ones you don't want. Moral? No, he gets to get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. The word speaking, of, by the way, of the gospel. Do not merely listen to the word, so deceive yourselves, verse 22. Do what it says. And then he goes on. Again, you don't have to be... This is crystal clear. James is beautiful, by the way. He uses all kinds of vivid and, and, and natural illustrations that make it so clear. And it's challenging. Like, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's one verse. If I did, if I if I just try, if I did that one thing this week, yeah, that would be good. And again, let me go back to let me. James, Jesus, James as he echoes Jesus, does not tell us to do anything we cannot do by His power. We just simply need to be reminded. Of, hey, you know what? Pay attention. Evaluate your life. Evaluate your. And one of the things, James, <laughs> well, you read James and you just start noting every time he talks about the tongue <laughs> and speaking. And what and, and it's like and the whole point is, the reason is, the tongue is the perfect, 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 unfortunately perfect indicator of what's going on in my heart. Scripture actually teaches that. And so James is saying, listen, guard your tongue, check yourself. What's coming out? Okay, do a bit of evaluation by the power of God. All right. So, application. Four ones. I'll close with this. Uh, maybe this week, read a chapter of James a day. If you don't already have a reading plan, I'm not saying. If you don't have one, just pick up James, read one chapter a day. Okay? Out of that one chapter, take one verse. So, for example, you could say, um, my dear brother and sister, chapter one, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. I'm going to start there. I don't have to work. I'm, I can't handle the whole thing and all the topics he covers, so I'm just going to take that one because I feel like that's the one I need to work on. Fair enough. Take one chapter, one verse, and take one item or one area, choosing that one thing that you will recognize and say, all right, God, by your grace, your power working my life, I want to change and be more like you in this. I want to be quick to listen. I want to listen more. I, want, I don't want to be so quick to talk. I really want to be slow to anger. God, I'm trusting and believing by your power that you can help me with this. And I want to. That's one prayer, by the way. See? One chapter. One verse, one item, one prayer. God, by your power, help me be victorious to change, to do this one thing today like you want me to do. For you are my Savior who rescued me. You are my Lord whom I love and my King who I willingly desire to obey. You may be sitting here today and, say, and saying, I can't do this. Even with the passages you've read, I can't do this. You may be sitting here today and you may have realized that you've never even cared what God wanted for your life. You may be here, and you're beginning to see that your life does not square with God. That you are guilty of breaking his laws, his rules, his best. Many of them, let alone just one. You may be sitting here today, and you may be feeling, you know what, I need forgiveness for my sin. 
The beauty of it all, the beauty of, of the message that is embedded in James, is that we can have forgiveness of our sins by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, as we talked about earlier. And if you're here today and, and you read this book today and this week and you're just like, I don't know if I have a relationship with Christ, <coughs> the good news is by simply placing your faith in Christ, you are deemed righteous before God, saved, forgiven, the whole kit and caboodle, just by placing your faith in Him. And the icing on the cake is, then, by the power of Christ working in your life, your life can be to change, change in the ways that James talks about. And that's good news. Let's pray. Oh God, uh, thank you so much for your gracious word, particularly today. Thank you for your imminently applicable and practical book of James. As we read it, would you please change our hearts, the directions, the things that you want to change in our lives by your power in Jesus' name.